pleasure that she is here. Um, along with, the, with her is Bilal Bhutra Zardari, who needs no introduction. He is the leader of the Pakistan People's Party, uh, one of the largest political parties in Pakistan, and a party that has a great and illustrious history of fighting for civilian rule, constitutional development, and pluralism in Pakistan. Thank you both. Thank you for being here. Also, of course, the chair of the Human Rights Committee of Parliament. Um, it is, um, we are here today to discuss uh, issues of the Constitution, citizenship, and security, and how these three things tie in with each other. Uh, now, the relationship between the Constitution and uh, citizenship is fairly evident and clear, certainly for those of us who live in democracies or aspire to live in democracies and democratic dispensations. Um, the relationship between security, however, in constitutionalism and citizenship, particularly as it pertains to fundamental rights, has historically been a fraught and complicated relationship. Um, I think we need to unpack, and I hope that we will unpack uh, with, with the help of our illustrious panelists, um, what these relationships are and how we, you know, we need to unpack what's called constitutionalism, um, citizenship and security are and how they engage with each other either to create a rights respecting pluralistic society or to create concentric circles of authoritarianism and, um, and other um, non-pluralism related uh, navigational societal frameworks uh, for social organization. I would like, therefore, it is my great privilege to request uh, Ms. Najilani to please address us and give us her views on the, the matter. Please, if you could. Thank you. You know, I've been um, through the previous two sessions, and um, I do believe that uh, the, the, the inner As I was saying, I just heard very eminent panelists in the last two sessions. The women's uh, movement, the feminist perspective on how life is today in Pakistan and how it was previously. I also heard our intellectuals and our um, um, writers and how they described the times that they have been through and how um, literature has reflected and mirrored the, the times that we, are going, we have been through in this country. One thing that springs to my mind is that citizenship, while it does not cancel class differences or diversity, our experience has been one where we have been told again and again that homogeneity is the value that we must hold fast to. And this enforced homogeneity has led us to really forget how to celebrate diversity. And many of our trends that we today regret and openly uh, criticize are the result of our forgetting that we are not only a pluralistic nation, and as Nuruda said uh, earlier on, there is not one nation, there are many nations here. I will take it even a little further. There is not one identity. There are many identities in each one of us. And it is at a time in our life when experiences are specific that one particular part of ourselves emerges. And that is the part we start asserting. If I am a woman and I am met with oppression, 
that identity will emerge, but that doesn't mean that I don't have other identities. I do contain many identities. And when we talk about this whole question of the relationship of the citizen and the state, this is an important uh, perspective that we must have. The citizen is not one. The citizen is many. And there are many aspects to our citizens, citizenship. We have now started separating the citizen and the state in a manner in which our own experiences are reflected in our reaction to the state or the response to the state. We always talk of the state being something totally different from us, which is not the reality. If you look at our constitution, it doesn't say the state of Pakistan gives itself this constitution. It's we the people. And suddenly then, we disappear somewhere in the notion of we the people. It becomes the state. The state must do this, or the state then becomes an entity on its own without the people. Because you give the state a religion, and that's what people must accept. You give the state honor, and that's where the honor of the people must lie. You give the state a security uh, uh, dimension, and that's the security of the people. The reality, however, is that today, the state has taken on an identity of its own where the, there is now a conflict of interest between the people and the state. The state claims sovereignty and in the name of sovereignty suppresses any expression of our woes and our grievances in the first place and also bars anyone outside from supporting or in any way commenting on how the state is, is treating its own people. So, or, and I'm here, I'm speaking like a human rights defender whose job it is to make visible the reasons why there is a sudden urge during times of repression to assert the right to defend human rights. The right to defend human rights is an independent right on its own, which can never be suppressed. But when we claim that right to defend human rights and others support our right to defend human rights, the whole notion of sovereignty suddenly springs up. Now, I feel that these expressions or claims of sovereignty sound so hollow. When the, the state is not sovereign, it's the people who are sovereign, we are told. And yet, it is the state who claims the right not to be told how to treat its people based on their notion of sovereignty. So, in a way, they want to suppress their own people, claim it as their sovereign right, and claim also that nobody has the right to criticize them. So this whole notion of sovereignty is very much also linked with how the relationship between the citizen and the state is to be constructed. Is the state sovereign or are the people sovereign? From this particular notion then springs this whole question of the right to participate. Do people or citizens have a right to participate in every, at every level of governance? Yes, they do. That is one of the most precious rights 
that we have and for which many amongst us have fought and strived to pre preserve for a long, long time. The right to participate means that we have the right to express ourselves. We have the right to the freedom of association and we have the right of peaceful assembly. When the state claims for itself security and a national interest where people's exercise of freedoms is seen as a threat, it is then that we need to worry about where we as citizens are going to be placed by the state. I think many amongst us here are now old enough to have lived many eras in this country. And I also know that many of us have suffered the penalty of dissent. So it, the, the, the expression of dissent is not new to Pakistan. It will never be something that, has, that is now emerging. But one thing that I know from my own experience and the experience of many of you sitting in front of me is that resistance will always find its way like water. You may try to obstruct it through any kind of oppressive measures that you want, water will find its way out. And this is what resistance will do. Unfortunately, this is not a lesson that anyone who has ever been in a position of authority will ever understand and learn a lesson from. I also know that there have been movements to, pre to protect rights in all the 70 years that Pakistan has been in existence, whether it comes from people like Kishwar Naheed and Faiz Ahmed Faiz, or it comes from people like Nisar Usmani, or it comes from people like Mehmood Ali Kasuri, from amongst the uh, legal brain, uh, uh, minds in our country. That resistance has always been there. The point that I feel where difference lies between today and some of the previous eras that we have been through is the resistance that we had posed was against an enemy we could see. Today, the enemy is well concealed and you cannot pinpoint where the malice is coming from. And believe me, malice is so apparent in what we are seeing today. There is small-mindedness, there is pettiness, there is vindictiveness that has tainted all the high ideals that people like me have had in terms of defending human rights. Accountability is a value that we have all uh, um, 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 valued. Yet, I have never seen how discredited a process can make accountability. Rule of law is something that we have all valued. Nevertheless, when the laws become a tool of oppression, how can we presume that this is the notion of rule of law that we value? Where we, the rule of law that we value presumes the law to be fair and just. 
It presumes that the institutions for the administration of justice are independent and are not the victims of stunted political growth capable of being manipulated to the detriment not of individuals but to the detriment of the values of democracy, of the rule of law, of human rights, and all notions of fairness and justice that we have ever um, inculcated. So I, I do think that today it's not, the need is not to say that the state that has alienated itself from us, the people, is in somebody's hands. Today is the time to say we are going to reclaim the state. And we will reclaim it. Many people have already said in the earlier sessions that yes, we have challenges. Yes, there are many things that we still have to achieve and there is a long road to, uh, to success yet but what people like me, who are human rights people, what energizes us, us are even the small successes. So let us say that much needs to be done, but let us also not forget that we have been successful in bringing some significant changes, not only socially, but to our political landscape. And these are the small successes, or the successes, let me say, because I think they are significant and not really small. That should energize us. Human rights defenders cannot afford the luxury of pessimism. So I am not going to say that we are helpless or hopeless. We have been able to achieve changes. And, and I must also say, that these changes were very painful to, to get. We went through a painful period, but not a minute of that pain do I regret today. I think every effort that we have made, whether it was successful or not, was worth making. Every pain that we have taken is worth it. We didn't need to be in governments. We have achieved this despite governments, rather than because of them. And I gave you some names of the people who did make a change. Nisar Usmani did not have to go on television and with a coy smile say, I can't say this. He said it. So let me say that when there is a, there is a slogan which is very popular amongst human rights people and activists, which is Sada Ahak Atherak. Now, Sada Haq Athe Raq is really a chorus. It doesn't mean Mera Haq. It means Sada Haq. So, if you are a woman, or you are a non-Muslim minority, se belong karti hai, ya Ahmadiyya community, se belong karti hai, ya aap kisi marginalized community, se belong karti hai, kisi soupe se belong karti hai, uh, PTM se belong karti hai, ya uh, kisi Baloch uh, nationalist party se belong karti hai, आप जब कहते हैं साडा हक तब आप बताते हैं कि हम एक सिटीजन नहीं हैं हम सिटीजंस हैं और हमारे जो हकूक हैं ये किसी की रिस्पांसिबिलिटी है टू टू प्रोटेक्ट देम रियासत वो नहीं है जो हमारे हकूक छीन रही है हमारे लिए रियासत का नोशन ये है कि रियासत की ये जिम्मेदारी है कि हमारे हकूक को प्रोटेक्ट करे सो so, अगर वो रिस्पांसिबिलिटी टू प्रोटेक्ट पूरी नहीं कर सकते तो हमारा ये हक है कि हम उन हकूक को डिफेंड करें और किसी ऐसी सरकमस्टेंस वो चाहे पॉलिटिकल इमरजेंसी हो या वो वॉर टाइम हो एब्सेंस ऑफ पीस एंड सिक्योरिटी डज नॉट जस्टिफाई कर्टेलमेंट ऑफ राइट्स वाइल सम राइट्स मे बी कर्टेल्ड इन अकॉर्डेंस विद लॉ the right to defend human rights can never be curtailed. So here we are, we are defenders of our rights and those of, those of others who do not have a voice. 
And let us today not say that we rue the times that we are looking at today. Let us say we are prepared and we will fight it together. Thank you, Hina Jirani. Uh, you raised some very pertinent and very critical points about not just uh, what the relationship between the state and its citizens should be, but also what, uh, how the struggle for rights and the protection of rights is ongoing and permanent. Um, it is also, you raised some interesting points about how um, it is important for people to speak up and speak the truth and uh, defend those rights and how there has been a um, significant failure uh, in our polity to do that at critical points in time uh, where voices have been have spoken out but then equally critical voices have been silent. Um, I would now like to invite Bilawal Bhutra Zardari to tell us how he views the situation and how a politician navigates this very difficult terrain. Bilawal Bhutra Zardari. Thank you. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'd like to thank the Jinnah Institute for inviting me uh, to this uh, forum. I'm just coming from our joint uh, parliamentary session on Kashmir. Uh, and I think it's significant that I'm coming from our joint parliamentary session on Kashmir, where we're talking about uh, not only our own national security, but we're complaining about human rights violations in Kashmir. Um, I would be able to defend I would be able to not defend, I'd be able to oppose the human rights violations in Kashmir with far greater moral authority had, uh, or our parliamentary joint session would be able to uh, defend the rights of Kashmiri citizens and the abuses of human rights uh, and oppose the human rights abuses in Kashmir had we the moral authority, had we defended the human rights of, pa of Pakistanis living in Pakistan. And that is why I think it's so important that on the very day that I was uh, in the joint session, I'm also standing before you today, because we need to move. Pakistan needs to move away from a national security state towards a rights-based society. That's where the world is moving, and, and Pakistan needs to decide if it wants to move in that direction or if it wants to continue uh, to look inward uh, we often hear the argument of uh, security, the prominence of national security is not only uh, uh, an, an issue in Pakistan, in established democracies we've watched uh, how we've compromised on human rights. The champions of democracies have kept compromised on their human rights in the name of national security. So the fact that we have done so here in Pakistan or so keen to do, here, do so here in Pakistan is not unique, particularly given our cycle, our regular cycle of, uh, of uh, every 10 years that we go through uh, between a slightly more democratic environment towards a more authoritarian environment, and that is the transition under new names and a new guise and a new, in a nea way that we're seeing today. Uh, it is a, it's a transition. It's a transition away from, uh, uh, fr from democratic ideals, from a more... There is no national security. With, there, is no, there is no national security without a preservation of your rights. There is no security without the security of your fundamental rights. If you are not guaranteed the right to life, if you are not guaranteed a, a, a rule of law and the right to due process, then what is the point of security? We can only secure ourselves once we can secure our rights. And obviously, we want to secure individual Pakistanis' rights from non-state actors. But by no means can, we, can that, we allow that to mean that we will allow the state to infringe upon our rights. And unfortunately, we've been allowing that to happen. Uh, we've been, when I say we, I, I, I mean not only my political opponents across the aisle, uh, uh, all of us, uh, Democrats, human rights defenders, we all transitioned uh, f uh, 
away uh, from these rights. We all stop defending them as vociferously as we once used to, be it under Zia or under Musharraf, again, under fear of terrorism, under the desire to unite this country, to combat that. But now, we need to focus on moving away from a national security state to a rights-based state. And if you look at the past 10, 11, 12 years, we've transitioned, if you talk about governments, and obviously that's my job, I have to talk about a comparison between different political parties' governments. We've moved from, under the Pakistan People's Party government, uh, from a government that was empathetic about human rights. No one in this room can deny, despite how critical they may, may be, that the Pakistan People's Party was at the very least empathetic towards human rights. Then we went through five years of a government, a government that was apathetic about human rights. And now we have a government that is outright antipathy towards human rights or rights of any kind. So it, it falls upon us to now fight this battle. And it is not just a legal battle in the courts or a political battle on the uh, floor of parliament. It's a battle of hearts and minds, because unfortunately, somehow, Democrats, human rights defenders, are losing a battle of hearts and minds amongst a segment of society, who in the name of national security, national interest, patriotism, uh, religion, are more than willing to not only compromise on their rights, but on everyone's rights. And that's because we need to think, change the way we're thinking, the way we're educated. We need to make every Pakistani citizen, every child understand that the state belongs to the people. The people don't belong to the state. We have to make every Pakistani, every Pakistani child understand that state institutions belong to the people, people don't belong to state institutions. We have to make every Pakistani, every Pakistani child understand that even our economy, the economy belongs to the people, the people aren't a commodity to be traded. Their rights to be compromised, their economic rights to be compromised. They need to have a stake in this economy. And we won't have economic development or progress until we decide how we're going to give the people of Pakistan a stake in this economy. We need to. We need to make every Pakistani, every Pakistani child understand that the solution to our problems is not less democracy, it's not less rights, it's not less freedom. The solution to all our problems, whichever problem the Pakistan is facing today, is more democracy, more democracy, and more democracy. And at this point in time, that's a challenge. At this point in time, that is a challenge. As you say, the enemy or uh, the multiple enemies of democracy and human rights in, in Pakistan, they're not right in front of you as they are during a dictatorship. They're drunk on power. They're drunk on power and they believe just because they can do something, they have gotten away with doing something. That's the way it should be and that's the way it's always going to be. But that's not the case. And they really need to understand, every democratic force in this country really needs to understand, that just as the people of Kashmir will not give up on their right to freedom, will not compromise on their rights come what may, the people of Pakistan, the democratic, peace-loving people of Pakistan, who were promised a pluralistic, democratic society by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, are not going to give up on that dream, come what may. But the challenge before us now and I seek your guidance and I look forward to a discussion on this, 
is how. If this is under Naya Pakistan, Ham Naya Amriyat ka makabla kar rahe hain. If this is dictatorship 2.0, then what is the resistance 2.0 going to look like? How are we going to find back, fight back now? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Bilal Tuzardari, from empathy to indifference to antipathy. That is one way of looking at the last 12 years of our recent history. Um, I will now uh, open this up to, to questions, and um, I will, I will uh, exercise my right to ask you questions first. Um, my first question is to you, Hina Jilani, and it is this, that when we, here we are, and we are talking about citizenship and the constitution and security, and it is almost as if Pakistani history is in a loop. It's the same sort of cycle, uh, a democratic authoritarian cycle that repeats itself. And I put to you, I mean, we are very adept at criticizing politicians. We are adept at criticizing power centers that are deeply entrenched, uh, oligarchies that refuse to give up, up uh, uh, their share of power. But I put this to you we have seen a steady erosion of democratic values in our country. We have seen an erosion of the values of human claim to espouse. How do you respond to that? Do you think that that is the case? If that was the case, I'd be very worried. Um, I'm not very proud of the human material we have in this country. Let me be very frank. But at the same time, as I said, the hope is always in what Mr. Bilawal Bhutto Zardari just said, democracy, democracy, and more democracy. We weren't happy with, uh, we aren't happy with our politicians. But one belief that we have and to which we are committed is that the process must go on. We cannot have a democratic process without political parties. So while we may treat them as whipping dogs all the time, we must also remember that there's an elephant in the room. And Sherry has heard me say this before. Urdu ka mahavra hai ke chike ka muh khula ho, to billi to aegi. To bhai sahab, chike ko to aap galiyan dete hain. Ke isne muh kyun khula hua hai? Billi ko bhi kabhi koi samjha de. To bhai sahab, us, el us elephant ko, जो कभी कोई शकल धार के और कभी कोई और शकल धार के हमारे सामने खड़े हो जाता है और एक नेशनल माइंडसेट बना देता है कि ये सियासी जो तबका है ये तो सब चोर हैं और इनसे तो काम चलेगा नहीं तो भाई साहब आपने काम कब चलाया इन सियासतदानों ने तो मुल्क के दो हिस्से नहीं किए इन सियासतदानों ने तो एक्सट्रीमिज्म और मिलिटेंसी नहीं पैदा की हाँ ये जरूर था कि इनको खड़े हो जाना तो ये था बहुत पहले लेकिन अगर खड़े हुए हैं तो अब अब इनके पीछे होंगे क्योंकि वो हमारी वैल्यूज हैं और ये हमारी जरूरत है आई एम सॉरी टू से मैं उन लोगों से इख्तलाफ रखती हूँ जो कहते हैं कि दीज पॉलिटिशियंस आर डिस्पेंसेबल दे आर इनडिस्पेंसेबल ये हमारी जरूरत है और अगर हम अपनी जमहूरियत को वैल्यू करना चाहते हैं तो मेरे अजीज हम वतनों आप अपनी फलाह और अपनी बहबूद के लिए रियलिटी को पहचानिए अगर हम अकाउंटेबिलिटी का जो मौजूदा प्रोसेस है विंडिक्टिवनेस का जो मौजूदा प्रोसेस है उसके खिलाफ बात करते हैं और हम ये कहते हैं कि आपने एक अच्छी चीज को एक बुरा नाम दे दिया है तो हम सिर्फ इनके लिए नहीं कह रहे हम कह रहे हैं उस रूल ऑफ लॉ के लिए जिसे हम प्रिजर्व करना चाहते हैं इंस्टीट्यूशंस की उस क्रेडिबिलिटी के लिए जो अब इरोड हो रही है यानी हम मैं सुप्रीम कोर्ट की वकील हूं और मेरी अब उम्र ऐसी हो गई है कि मैं ये कह सकती हूँ और मुझे कोई आर नहीं है कि अगर इस, इस पर कोई अदारा ऑफेंड होता है कि ये सुप्रीम कोर्ट जो लेगेसी छोड़ जाएगा वो बहुत अच्छी नहीं होगी हमने बहुत वक्त देखे हैं जब जुडिशरी इंडिपेंडेंट नहीं थी लेकिन फिर भी हम एक एक, एक मैं वकील की हैसियत से 
और एक पॉलिटिशियन जो हर वक्त जेल में होता था उसकी बेटी की हैसियत से मुझे उम्मीद होती थी कि रिलीफ मिल जाएगी आज मेरे पास कोई तड़पता हुआ आता है तो मैं घबराती हूँ यह रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी लेते हुए कि मैं इसको रिलीफ दिलवा सकूंगी या नहीं तो मैं ओपनली आज ये बात कर रही अगर आपने अपने अदारों को प्रिजर्व करना है तो इकट्ठे हो जाए एक प्रिंसिपल के ऊपर ये ना सोचें कि ये प्रिंसिपल इसको इसको बचा लेगा या उसको बचा लेगा ये खुश तो बड़े होते हैं इट्स वेरी एंटरटेनिंग कि आज इसको पकड़ लिया हा हा आज इसको जेल में डाल दिया हा हा लेकिन यही वक्त जब आप इस तरीके से इरोड करते हैं अपने वैल्यूज को अपने प्रिंसिपलिटी को आप देख रहे हैं कि क्या तमाशा हो रहा है पिछले तीन सालों से यू वॉन्ट टू गिव द डॉग अ बैड नेम एंड देन हैंग इम आप इस तरीके से लोगों को आपने रिजीम चेंज के लिए अकाउंटेबिलिटी और अदालतों को इस्तेमाल करना शुरू कर दिया आप अगर ये होने देंगे तो फिर तो कोई चेंज आपके सामने नहीं आएगा चेंज हम कैसे करेंगे अपनी इंस्टीट्यूशन को सपोर्ट करें मैं बिलावल भुट्टो जरदारी को सपोर्ट नहीं करूंगी सिर्फ लेकिन मैं ये कहूंगी कि पार्लियामेंट आज वो अदारा है जिसे हमने मजबूत करना है अगर आज हमारी फॉरेन पॉलिसी बननी है तो पार्लियामेंट बताएगी कि क्या फॉरेन पॉलिसी होनी चाहिए अगर हमारी डिफेंस पॉलिसी बननी है तो पार्लियामेंट बताएगी कि क्या डिफेंस पॉलिसी होनी चाहिए हमने बड़े तमाशे देख लिए हैं पिछले कई दिहाइयों से जिसमें हमें ऐसी सिक्योरिटी सिचुएशन में धकेल दिया गया है कि उससे हमें बाहर निकलना मुश्किल हो गया है दुनिया में हम आइसोलेट हो गए और हमें कहते ये हैं कि जो ह्यूमन राइट्स के लोग हैं ये शोर में जाते हैं इसलिए हम बदनाम होते हैं भाई साहब जो आप करते हैं आप बदनाम उसकी वजह से होते हैं हमारे कहने से नहीं होते सो दीज आर सम ऑफ द थिंग्स आई थिंक वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड एज सिटीजन वी आर नॉट सिटिंग इन अ पावर पोजिशन ऑफ डिसीजन मेकिंग बट वी आर सर्टनली सिटिंग इन अ पोजिशन वेयर वी कैन मेक श्योर दैट आवर इंस्टीट्यूशन फील सपोर्टेड इनफ and don't feel like criminals our democratic institutions our democratic yes. institutions feel that they are supported we need to support these institutions main ek aurat ki haisiyat se mujhe kehte hain ki ji women uh, uh, must have a role in 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 security uh, issues and in peace and security aur laga diya hai mujhe idps ko dekhne mein sari umar hamari ho gayi hai ki ji aurte jo hai wo idps aur isme kaam karengi i feel very proud when i work for idps but that doesn't empower me feeling good and feeling empowered are two different things aaj hamara national security imperatives kya hai isme isko determine karne mein meri kya awaaz hai aapki awaaz hai aap batayenge ki hamare national security imperatives kya aap determine kar sakte hain hame bata diya jata hai aur phir kaha jata hai is pe tum sab act karo aaj tak humse yahi kaha jata hai ke ye situation aa gayi hai ab sare सेक्रीफाइस करें कुर्बानियां दें कुर्बानियां दें भाई साहब आई एम डन विद कुर्बानी ये मुल्क हमने कुर्बानियां देने के लिए नहीं बनाया था हमने फ्रीडम के बेनिफिट्स उठाने के लिए बनाया था आई एम श्योर कि आप लोग जो बैठे हैं जो उस वक्त वहाँ मौजूद थे जब पाकिस्तान बन रहा था तो आप लोगों ने ये नहीं कहा था कि आओ पाकिस्तान बनाए बड़ा मजा आएगा कुर्बानियां देंगे Okay, <laughs> now that's a good point to move on. Bilal uh, Bhutto, uh, you mentioned, and Sorjan Jalani, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the, uh, people's economic rights. Uh, you mentioned uh, the business of inequity, rising poverty in this country. I put to you, uh, when we are faced with all of this conundrum, we are always told that it is the political parties that fail to deliver to people. that space is created for authoritarianism that space is created for anti democratic forces because political parties are extractive and rent seeking and that they fail to actually deliver an improvement in the lives of people that this is the crisis of democracy in pakistan that is in fact not that there are overweening power centers that seek to erode your liberties but that the people um uh, tasked with preserving our liberties our politicians fail to do so so how do you respond to that that uh, uh, uh that charge and how do you see the culpability of democratic pol political parties in the mess that we are in or not Thank you. Uh, 
that's a great question. Um, and it is the standard uh, talking point uh, of uh, the establishment in Pakistan that we're um, nothing and we don't want to get involved in anything. Time to dislodge a, a, a democratic uh, setup. Uh, every civilian prime minister of Pakistan, every single one, has been removed on corruption charges. Not a single, well, okay, once, uh, barring uh, the most recent very controversial conviction, not a single civilian Prime Minister of Pakistan had been convicted of any such crime. They say that history repeats itself. First is a tragedy, and then is a farce. So I'm presuming that this is the farce. Uh, and that is what we're facing today. Uh, if I have to respond to this argument, I must first admit that absolutely there's room for improvement in our democracy. There's most certainly room for improvement amongst our political parties. There's definitely room for improvement in how we govern. Um, but when you ask, okay, why did political parties fail to deliver? You have corruption in that, rent-seeking in that, political compromises. But the fundamental reason that no, that, that, uh, a, 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 that no civilian prime minister has completed their term is not because they failed to deliver. It's because anti-democratic forces conspired and forced them out. And every time, we tell ourselves that this time will be different. Every time we believe that we are pursuing uh, corruption, and accountability, and every little rights. And national security is not an excuse. It has been used as an excuse, and as a result, neither have we met our national security objectives, and nor have we managed to progress as a society. And ultimately, the people of Pakistan are going to get fed up. We, as politicians, as responsible politicians, want to channel the emotions of the people uh, towards parliament, towards democratic institutions. But if we consistently have parliament fail, and frankly, I am often extremely underwhelmed, embarrassed when I attend. Uh, uh, it, it upsets me that this highest body in the land has been so compromised and undermined. But if we've lost faith, in, if the people lose faith in Parliament, if the people lose faith in judiciary, and I must second what was said, even during dictatorships, and I mean in dictatorships, my grandfather was hanged, in those dictatorships, my father was kept in prison for 11 and a half years without any conviction, only to be uh, acquitted of each crime uh, after having come out. That I had more faith in, 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 in the institution of the judiciary under dictatorship than I do today. And that is something I should never have to come to the point to say. And there, there are multiple reasons for that. I mean, one of the fundamental reasons is there was so much hope that our expectations, once again, were played with by the lawyers' movement, the way that, 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 that sort of trajectory has panned out. And it's now up to the judici judiciary because there's nothing I can do, there's nothing you can do to increase their integrity. Because the integrity of the judiciary can't be enforced by contempt of court. 
The integrity of the judiciary cannot be enforced by removing people. A civilian supremacy was being targeted. When the very electoral process was being targeted, the highest the highest judiciary in the land was building a dam. <laughs> and we weren't allowed to question the dam because that was Article 6 treason. And none of these human rights concerns that are very pressing at all levels today, that have become, that, 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 that there's a greater consensus about the concerns uh, and the compromises that are made on this front. None of these human rights containments or abuses fit within this criteria of Suomoto. But the dam did. So just as we have to, and absolutely this, to improve parliament, there's a whole host of things we have to do, but also improve political party. But we have to improve all democratic institutions. But and the faith in those institutions can only be improved by the people within those institutions. They most certainly can be undermined by people without this institution. Um, thank you. I understand. I think both of you are saying, are suggesting that we are uh, <coughs> in a moment of what you could see as a, a moment of constitutional authoritarianism, if you will. Um, um, that we, that it is not just enough to have a, a rule of raw, law unless it is a rights respecting rule of law. Um, but that does not answer the fundamental question, and I, I, I really must insist on putting this to you. Uh, uh, we have to confront either the limits of the, the, the democratic human rights discourse or the flaws of the democratic human rights discourse. Because if we are perpetually in this cycle, this is if you are unable to repeatedly, despite repeated attempts, and there have been repeated heroic attempts, and by politicians as well, uh, who have lost their lives uh, trying to, to, to fight these very forces. But the question is, to me, this is a fundamental question now. The fundamental question is, why is this, this repetitive cycle, and why is Pakistan's um, um, civil and political society unable to overcome this moment? Laws are not in democracy or in human rights. Or Dusri Bat Ye Yadrakye ki human rights to hai wo koi pop achi ideal situation ke liye nahi bane hai. Wo mushkilat ke liye hi bane hai. Or un mushkilat me hi un values ko preserve karna aapki responsibility or yasaki responsibility banai kreti. As I've said, absence of peace and security doesn't justify non respect for human rights. Compliance is made for you obligatory because you don't have to come to the bad times. And if you have come, then you will transition to good times. In other words, that you blame the democracy and human rights, that you don't have to change, why not 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 change, कटारे में खड़ा करके और इनसे कहें आहा आप हार गए आप हार गए रू तो हमें ये करना चाहिए रिग्रेट तो हमें ये बात करनी चाहिए कि भाई साहब चौंसठ जो खड़े थे उनमें से पंद्रह किधर गए और पंद्रह जो गए उनका जमीर नहीं है इनका कसूर नहीं है कि वो पंद्रह नहीं खड़े हुए पंद्रह वोट कम हो गए दे वर द विक्टिम चौदह या जितने भी थे दिस इज वॉट वरीज मी कि हम जिस एक एक हादसे को जो ये देखते हैं ना क्या कहते हैं उसको जो आपकी जर्नलिस्टिक टर्म में एक खास शक्ल दे देते हैं और वो हाँ स्पिन दे देते हैं तो वो जो स्पिन है उसको आपने काउंटर करना है और बड़ी अग्रेसिवली करना है क्योंकि वो ही स्पिन है जो आपके लोगों में एक माइंडसेट को उभार रही है और जब इस किस्म की हुकूमतें आती हैं तो आप नोट करेंगे कि जो हमारे वर्स्ट इंस्टिंक्ट्स हैं ना वो उजागर होते हैं हमारी हेट्रेड्स उजागर होती है हमारी वायलेंस उजागर होती है तो ये सब चीजें हमारे हाथ में भी हैं टू मच टू अ लॉट ऑफ टू एन एक्सटेंट यू आर राइट पर द पॉइंट इज फिंगर पॉइंटिंग भी जरूरी है लेकिन सही तरफ करें सही तरफ करें 
ये रिपीट क्यों होता है ये इसलिए तो नहीं होता कि हम हमारे जैसे लोग खामोश हो गए हम तो बोल रहे हैं ऐसे लोग तो मेरे ख्याल में यू खान के वक्त में भी बोले बाकी से जीन जया मुशर्रफ जो भी अथॉरिटेरियनिज्म थे उसके खिलाफ बोलते रहे हमारा देखिए मैं जब वीमेंस मूवमेंट के जिना के लॉ के हवाले से जब हम काम कर रहे थे 25 साल नहीं ना बदला था कानून तो मुझे लोगों ने ताने देने शुरू किए कि हमें 25 साल हो गए आपको माल रोड पे खड़े हुए प्ले लेके आप खड़ी नहीं है डाउन विद जिना ऑर्डिनेंस ऑल एंड यू हैव गेन्ड नथिंग एक्सेप्ट वेट तो भाई साहब दैट वॉज नॉट दी ओनली थिंग आई गेंड जिस वक्त उन्नीस में इलेक्शन हुआ कौन आया एक खातून प्राइम मिनिस्टर बनाई आप आपकी हर पॉलिटिकल पार्टी इंक्लूडिंग जमात इस्लामी ने खातन का राइट्स अपने मैनिफेस्टो में रखे अब इससे बड़ी जब आपने औरतों के राइट्स को पॉलिटिकल एजेंडा का एक हिस्सा बना दिया इससे बड़ी जीत हम और क्या आपके लिए ला सकते थे बाल रोड पे खड़ा होकर speaking against what is happening no of course the fault lies with those people who have no conscience i understand i understand that you are saying that the fight for pluralism and democracy and rights is incremental and slow and there are many setbacks and this is a long process but in the interest of of abhi aapki baari nahi aayi hai but in the aayegi abhi but in the interest of uh, uh, having a good discussion which is why i am here i would like to ask you why is it why is it that in turkey a far more authoritarian state the price of a coup has risen to the point where people can stand on the streets stand in front of those tanks and fail foil that coup why is it ki yahan tv station ko ja ke take over karte log baki sab sote rehte hain kisi ko pata hi nahi chalta uske baad to coup bhi ho chuka hota hai ye kyu hai ye aisa kyu hai wahan kya badla aur yahan kya nahi badla ye 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 sawal hai aur ye i think this is a fundamental question hamari history bhi mukhtalif hai हमारे लोगों की जो एक कंडीशनिंग है वो भी मुख्तलिफ है और ये बात भी दुरुस्त है कि अंधों में काना राजा बन जाता है तो अगर हमारी फ्लॉज की वजह से कोई अपने आप को इन्विंसिबल समझता है तो ये भी उसकी गलती है क्योंकि हम आहिस्ता आहिस्ता हम भी बेहतर होते जा रहे हैं हमारे फ्लॉज भी ख़त्म होते जा रहे हैं तो ये जो अपने आप को इन्विंसिबल समझते हैं और ये समझते हैं कि ये हमारी पोलिटिकल ज़िंदगी को हमेशा ट करेंगे ये ये भी समझ जाए कि आज सिविल सोसाइटी भी बड़ी स्ट्रॉन्ग है यहाँ पर एनर्जेटिक लोग भी हैं आज बहुत से आम लोग जो पहले कोई और जबान बोलते थे आज अपने जबान भी अपना नैरेटिव भी बदल रहे और इस नैरेटिव को जो हमारे ऊपर थोपा जाता है उसको चैलेंज भी कर रहे सो तो ये ये बात दुरुस्त है कि हम अभी एक सिचुएशन में हैं जिसको हम कहते हैं ट्रांजिशन हमारे हमारी ट्रेजिडी ये है और बहुत से ममालिक की है कि कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन भी बन जाती हैं अथॉरिटेरियन रूल ख़त्म हो जाता है कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बन जाती है असम्बलियाँ भी आ जाती हैं लेकिन फिर भी हमारी मुश्किल ख़त्म नहीं होती क्योंकि हम बड़े आराम से हाथ बांध के कहते हैं कि हम अभी ट्रांजिशन में भाई साहब ये परपेचुअल स्टेट ऑफ ट्रांजिशन जिसमें हम ट्रैप हुए हुए हैं इसमें से हमें वक्त तो लगेगा लेकिन हम निकलेंगे Sir, so now I must I must uh, request Bilal Bhutto also to 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 uh, engage with this. What do you think? What do you think is the way forward, Bilal? Do you think that there is? Do you think that this Turkish comparison holds? Do you the, uh, the reaction to the Turkish coup, the comparison of the tu- recent Turkish coup attempt with the 1999 coup is unfair, uh, and we are yet to see how the people of Pakistan would respond to a coup today. Coup karke dikhaye, Pakistan ke awam. बाहर निकलेंगे पाकिस्तान के अवाम भी गैर जमुई ताकतों के सामने खड़े होंगे और शायद इसलिए शायद इसलिए आज हमारे सामने नहीं है शायद इसलिए आज हम 2.0 2.0 का आमरीत और नया आमरीत का मुकाबला कर रहे हैं इसलिए वो भी जानते हैं कि पाकिस्तान के अवाम जमहूरीत ही चाहते हैं और जमहूरीत के लिए लड़े नहीं एंड वी आर इन वाइल वी आर वॉचिंग A reversal uh, in Pakistan's sort of progress. We also know that we're standing in a very different moment in in in, 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 in at this point in time, and I think we will resist. Now that doesn't mean that they may not succeed or the resistance may not succeed. But I think you'll find uh, absolutely you'd you'd find a resistance. 
Uh, as far as your question is concerned, as to what is, you know, how we, it's, uh, there is absolutely uh, room for improvement within uh, democratic parties, and there's most certainly room for improvement within uh, perhaps the way we go about doing uh, our, our, our activism also. We, we should always be looking towards that. But the focus, uh, I talk myself, my own focus towards improving governance, improving service delivery, is going to be, there's only 24 hours in the day. And of those 24 hours, I'm either going to fight for saving democracy and human rights and freedom of the speech, or I'm going to do what my job is. And if every time you're going to force us to go back to that original fight, and then say, why are you not delivering as well as you could, and throw about money is the accusation, or what do you want to et etc. But there's blackmail, there's coercion, there's threats. Uh, that people face. On a, yeah. So, I'm not sure if you have a good idea. And um, ye, we are caught in a perpetual state of transition. Um, but there's also a young generation of Pakistanis that are just getting started. And you see that everywhere. It's not just in Sindh or in my party or in uh, other places. You see it with. Um, young politicians from FATA, uh, you see it with young Pakistanis, you meet uh, within Pakistan, without Pakistan. Um, we are not only aware of our rights, but also uh, aware that the world is a different place today. And Pakistan wants to be able to be a part of the modern world. We do not want to go back to what was before. It is, uh, as a follow-up, I think that this conversation has, though it has been interesting, has been uh, uh, highly conceptual and has dealt with ideas and concepts rather than specifics. Uh, there is, a, to you, Bilal, what I want to ask, I mean, wh what motivates you to be a democratic politician, particularly with your family history? I mean, like, really, you know, uh, things have not, you know, ended well earlier. And, and so what motivates you? What motivates you uh, to, to, to do this? Okay, so I think there's this, mm, two things to point out on this. One, that it's really uh, far easier in Pakistan to be an establishment politician. It is more profitable. It is uh, more comfortable. Um, and it is better for your career trajectory. Um, but I am not in politics in Pakistan for my career trajectory. I'm not in politics in Pakistan for profit. Uh, absolutely, we've suffered a lot. And um, for other people, that's a political uh, narrative. It's a story. It's something you've read in the paper and seen on TV. For me, it's my life, it's my mother, it's my uncles, it's my father, it's my grandfather. Um, and so just as much as that might seem like something that would scare you, would break you, would demotivate you, it is also the source of my inspiration and what drives me. The fact that um, so much has been sacrificed, and as you say, this country was not built for sacrifice, and we ask Pakistanis to be far too brave and to sacrifice far too much. But after all that sacrifice, what drives me as a son is the idea that I'm working to achieve my mother's unfinished agenda. And that is what allows one to get up in the morning and what allows one to face uh, the reality of, of, of Pakistan. And do you hope, do you believe that in your lifetime, uh, that in your career as a politician, you will in fact achieve, that you will in fact see the parliamentary supremacy that you think is lacking today? Uh, do you think that that is likely to happen? Um, so I would say that three years ago, I was far more optimistic uh, about that than I am today. But uh, absolutely, I believe it will happen. There is no other option for Pakistan 
do you do you do you think do you think that this 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 these problems that both of you have 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 you know explained and and dilated on do you think that these things are heading towards a solution or are we going to remain uh, caught up in this logjam this cul-de-sac if you will do you see this changing i think at the moment the picture is going to not the the picture is very bleak but when has it been very bright anyway? But well, we have survived. We have survived. We have the will. If we have the will to survive, then I think things will change. Look, one this Punjabi film is not going on that one hand is sitting and the other is trying to get up. Somewhere the hands will open, right? And they will open. So I think that, as I have said before, the time has changed. आपके यहाँ ये जो आपके लोग इक्वेट करते हैं अपने नीच और अपने हकुक को ह्यूमन राइट्स से ये नहीं था आज से 30 साल पहले अब लोग ह्यूमन राइट्स के हवाले से हक मानते हैं और जानते हैं कि ये अब उनका एक इल इन एलियनेबल राइट है और ये रियासत की जिम्मेदारी है उसकी कोई मेहरबानी नहीं है तो ये बातें फर्क लाती हैं ठीक है हमारे हवाले से क्योंकि वन स्टेप फॉरवर्ड टू स्टेप बैकवर्ड हुए टाइम ज़्यादा लगेगा चेंज में भी स्लो पर चेंज हैज़ तू कम एंड इट डिड कम इट हैज़ कम अब जैसे बिलावल साहब ने फरमाया कि अब कू करके देखें मेरा ख्याल में इनको ना ही ये कहें क्योंकि ये ये शायद करने को तैयार भी हो जाएं मगर ये ये अब जो शेरवानी वाला बिठाते हैं सामने इनको भी समझ में आ रही है कि वक्त बदल गया है अच्छा अब वक्त क्योंकि गुजर रहा है we will open the floor to five questions four of which will be asked by women that's our act of positive discrimination for the thing four women and one man please Ali I want to say one thing about foreign policy and defence policy and how we absolutely need well, eight politicians and then be uh, women to be playing their part in that. But just now at the joint session where we were coming up with a joint resolution on, on Kashmir, the Pakistan People's Party was the only party who was both representative in that committee were women, Ms. Sherry Rahman and in Arabani Khar, so that needs to be pointed out. All right. Um, Kishwar Nahid Saiba uh, has a question. You can be the one man deal. <laughs> I'm a social activist. We work with kids, uh, with uh, gender minority groups. We work with, um, we create support groups for, you know, women as well, and men. Okay. So what I really want to talk about over here is about Kashmir, because I've been, um, you know, last night as well, I was watching this video where there were a couple of boys who were dancing in the middle of Sirinagar uh, post-curfew, and, you know, Jai Hind, Jai Hind, and all that. I really want to talk about why is it that the opposition talks about Kashmir when they're in the opposition, as soon as they find, um, you know, some power, some authority, that seat that you're going for, it, it, you never really talk about it. You never talk about human rights violations. You never talk about these kids, these people who are suffering in Kashmir. And by the way, the, within Kashmir, there is um, uh, Indian, Indian Kashmiris as well who also are being tortured because of the special status that Kashmir has. So that's what I really want to talk about. I, I want to see concrete action taking place because at the end of the day, 
parliamentarians, democratic people, uh, leaders are going uh, to talk yeah, about uh, whatever they... Sorry. I, I get, 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 I get the idea. I, I'd like I get to the see... Idea. I, I'll just, I'll just I'd like that. to see some kind of action taking place. Okay, please. thank you. And uh, next, uh, there's a gentleman at the back. And then we'll come to you. Um, Assalamu alaikum. My name's Usman. Um, so the point I wanted to make, I mean, Hila, Hina Jilani mentioned an elephant in the room. Quite frankly, there's so many elephants in the room now that we've, the room's a veritable zoo. And sort of one of the sort of elephants in the room is religion. I mean, you talk about democracy and stuff, but what kind of democracy is Pakistan really when a religious sort of minority can't um, expect to become the head of state in this country. You've immediately excluded a vast sort of swath of your population. Um, Bilal spoke about the Pakistani People's Party and their commitment to human rights. And yet that commitment wasn't there in 1974 when the Ahmadis by the you were declared non-Muslim. So sort of my question is moving forward, you can talk about democracy all you want for the majority, but where do you foresee a Pakistan which is democratic for everyone? Okay. For its minorities where an <laughs> Ahmadi is not an Ahmadi but a Pakistani, where a Christian is not a Christian but a Pakistani. Thank, thank you. Uh, one last question, the gentleman in the white foot uh, right there. He's been waiting for a very long time, and then we will uh, revert to the panelists. Folks. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shazib Khan. I am director at Pakistan's People at Disaster Management. My question is to Pakistan's People at Disaster Management. My question is to Bilawal Bhutto Zadari. Now, the panelist asked you if you expect that you are going to end up jailed. Uh, like your uh, father or grandfather or en en end up hung like your grandfather uh, because not. you might uh, end up having uh, facing the same struggle as them right can you hear me yes yes, yes. but i don't really think so because i think the way the modern world history is that things are getting better over time and uh, b b things that in the past were more violent than things now for example in the for example, for example, in the past, America dropped atom bombs and killed hundreds of thousands of Japanese. Now America does drone strikes and kills dozens of people, a handful every now and then. And in the past, we, uh, we America, uh, okay. I find the same thing in Pakistan as well. I think that- Okay, so you think that things are getting better in yeah. Pakistan? Okay, I, I think... I Can think I give an example first? To the panelists because we can first of all, I think, for example, that... The, do you really think that you will face the same kind of struggle as your father or grandfather? Or do you think that uh, things will be... Do you think that things will be better in Pakistan's future than... Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was... Um, all right. So, so questions for uh, you, Bilawal Bhutto, about... Uh, do you... Th I mean, you've answered this, but you cannot uh, take another stab at it. About how. Yes, 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 yes Sherry Rahman, president of the Jedi Institute, would like to ask a question. Thank you very much. I'm Sherry Rahman. I've really enjoyed this last session. Uh, and thank you to the panelists here. I wouldn't have intervened, but I think there's something critical all of you need to address, and that is the freedom of the press. I would like everyone's comments, including yours, Ali. Uh, as a human rights defender, briefly, that uh, where we are in terms of how free or unfree the press is and what leads to the press being and the media being um, muzzled. Uh, I have been working as a journalist when there was state censorship and I won't go into the I here or the personal experience and we have moved to another era where uh, the electronic and digital platforms are absolutely huge, but they too are in a state of, uh, shall we say, control. And where does that play into your uh, view of how democracy leverages media or how it works with that kind of media? Thank you. 
Um, as, uh, as per your request, Shahid Rahman, I will answer this very briefly. I think that it is quite evident to everybody that Pakistan media is, um, is, is facing their uh, political class moment, if you will, which is that they are demonized. They may not be perfect, but they are increasingly <coughs> demonized. They are uh, vilified and uh, they are being, uh, you know, uh, facing very severe severe curbs on, on basic freedom of, of, of expression and in doing their jobs. I think by now this is not really a matter of, of debate. I think it is quite obvious that that is the case. And certainly as someone who has been a working journalist um, uh, in, during the Musharraf dictatorship and, and who grew up during General Jawlak's dictatorship, I can tell you that I do not remember a time since the early days of General Jawlak where there have been this level and of curbs on free speech and on media freedoms. I mean, this is certainly my view. I think that there is really, it, you would have to be someone in denial um, to argue otherwise. And I would be very interested in actually in meeting someone who does argue otherwise. Bilal Bhutto, what do you have to say about media freedoms? Uh, I wasn't here during CS time, uh, but, uh, um, <laughs> Uh, but no, most certainly we've seen uh, uh, is part of the attempts to control absolutely everything in this country uh, that uh, media freedoms or freedom of speech, uh, everything from a, 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 a social media blogger uh, to prominent uh, right activists and politicians to uh, the news that you watch on television, it's muted and cut and uh, cancelled before your your very eyes, and that is not something that should be happening in a modern democratic state, in a modern state at all. Um, now, what do we do about it? Um, the most important thing is always to resist it, and, uh, which, which, uh, which we've absolutely been doing right from the offset. But what we have to do now is find ways to challenge it. So the couple of things that I'm working on uh, as far as, as, far as um, attempting to uh, improve our media freedoms environment. Obviously, we're in opposition and not in government. So what can we do? One thing that we are, we're working on with other opposition parties as well is legislation. Uh, we need to pass legislation at the federal level and in the provinces uh, that works uh, towards protecting not only freedom of speech in more concrete ways, but also uh, the security of journalists and the prosecution of crimes against journalists. That the journalists can do their job safely. Uh, the concept of freedom of the press is, uh, is, is, gonna, is going to remain a dream. Um, and then uh, another uh, 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 sort of step that we want to take, uh, the joint opposition is going to file uh, a petition in the Supreme Court of Pakistan on, on uh, freedom of the press and on freedom of speech, and we hope uh, to be able to advocate our case over there. And uh, given that recent judgments uh, have talked about the importance of freedom of the press, we expect uh, that the judiciary, uh, whose responsibility it is to protect not only mine and yours, but every uh, Pakistani's human rights, will protect our right to freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Uh, but having said that, this is an absolutely surreal time to be a Pakistani, because it, you are fed a diet of misinformation and propaganda, uh, and it's called news. Um, just the truth getting out for, for, for information's sake, so we can decide um, what the best course of action will be, is actually difficult now. I tried to argue this in, in, in Parliament a couple of sessions ago, that the whole point of democracy is uh, that we reach that, cons reach that consensus, and if everybody gets to speak their mind, you get uh, a whole host of opinions, and of those opinions, whichever is the best opinion or whichever is the best compromise uh, will be the best solution to the problem, and everybody will agree to that. But if you shut off everybody's, uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't let everybody speak and you only have the state narrative or the official narrative, then we'll never be able to uh, mm. address our uh, Thank you. Uh, Should we answer the question? Address the question. And I, I'll just take it um, uh, from where um, Mr. Bilal Bhutto has left off. 
Um, I, I think it's very important uh, for us to understand that the parliament strengthens itself when it plays a certain role, regardless of whether they are in the opposition or in government. Now, legislation and le the process of legislation, le legislating, is important for us. It doesn't matter whether the bill that you table will succeed or not. What matters is that per people also hear and debate on what you have presented so that there is an understanding of what is right and what is fair and what is just. And what is the view that is uh, uh, um, uh, opposed to the more draconian laws that we are facing. Look, as far as freedom of the press is concerned, Kanda must go. As far as accountability is concerned, NAB must go. And accountability, look, I see this accountability more un, uh, uh, suspiciously, not because of all the other things, that too, but if you were a genuine, you had the desire for accountability, you would not target people, you would target the system. We have not yet targeted the system. We have just targeted people under a system which we created, and I think there was a, a mistake that previous uh, governments have made, including People's Party and and PMLN, that they didn't see the injustices of this law and how it is going to really uh, pollute the rule of law uh, 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 and, and due process uh, values that we hold. So I think legislation by parliament, even the opposition, bill after bill, bring that in so that there are debates and people learn to understand and argue what is right and what is wrong. So we would really welcome anything that the opposition wants to do in order to give a contrast to what we are experiencing right now. And I think there, there will be a time when people start putting pressure, regardless of the pressure coming from the political party, people will put pressure that this is what we want and this is how it should be done. So freedom of the press. Now, I think what Kishwa um, Nahid had raised was this question of disappearances. You know, disappearances is one of the most serious international crimes. And Pakistan, I'm afraid, is this short, this short of coming in its grips. They, are, they feel very comfortable that we haven't signed the ICC, so we are very uh, um, uh, safe from being prosecuted. They, they have to understand that there are other trigger mechanisms. Even for Pakistan, this is not just a crime, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a kind of uh, brutality. Imagine somebody dies, that's the end, and there's a closure. Somebody disappears, there's never a closure. And our courts have said, recently one of the judges of the Supreme Court said, that unfortunately the families are unable to help us in identifying who has disappeared these people. Well, if he doesn't know, he doesn't need to be on the bench. And if they were able to help, they would not approach the courts. There are these nameless, faceless operators who disappear. And the, the victims are expected to go to the court and tell them who disappeared me. Once they are recovered, they go as a statistic in the Commission on Disappearances uh, file as their success. We have recovered so many people. I do all these disappearances cases and I know how much the commission succeeds in recovering anyone. When they are done with them, the people who have disappeared them, the namalooms, then those people reappear. And then the judiciary must say and come forward and ask them who disappeared you. And if they are unable to answer out of fear, they should come forward and say, we'll protect you. Have they ever done that? And they tell us that they are dealing with the issue of disappearances. Hundreds, you know, 1,200 disappeared. We have recovered 1,210. Okay, you've recovered them. Who disappeared them? We need to know. How do you hold them accountable? There's no accountability. So there is actually impunity for disappearances. People may get recovered from time to time and may reappear, 
but somebody must have disappeared them and that's a crime. We have never put anybody behind bars for dis disappearing anyone. So these are some of the things we, I think, need a solution for, and I'm so happy uh, that you, sir, are now the chairman of the, of the uh, Human Rights Committee. I hope that these are some of the questions that you will be able to raise. Who is going to hold people accountable for disappearances? And accountability is necessary to do away with this menace. Unless, unless and until there is accountability, there will, this menace will continue. And when the government says that they're going to bring a, a law on disappearances, I would like to ask them one question. Who is going to give you the name of the person who is responsible for the cr crime? Who is going to do that? So what will you have to do? You will have to make it the, an institutional responsibility, a command responsibility, where, where the organization will have to be held accountable. Will they be, ever be able to say that and do that in the law, saying that the organization that is under suspicion will be investigated, and if it is found that they disappeared them, they will be held accountable, not because of one person who cannot be identified, who actually picked up that man in the Safed Shalwar Kameez and the Safed Toyota Corolla. So if the organizations are accountable and there will be command responsibility, then we think that maybe the impunity will be finished. लेकिन अगर आप एक इंडिविजुअल क्राइम इसको बनाएंगे तो ना हम बता सकेंगे कि किसने उठाया और ना कभी उसको सजा होगी थैंक यू हिना जलानी आई वी कैन नॉट नाउ एंटरटेन एनी क्वेश्चन वी आर डन थैंक यू वेरी मच वी कुड नॉट हैव हैड ए बेटर पैनल टू टॉक अबाउट Constitution, citizenship, and security. Uh, I think that that it is it, it is not a matter of, of much debate. Hina uh, Jilani, your your work in this department is well known in these areas. But Aval Bhutto, you have emerged as as one of the signature voices today in our country on pluralism and fundamental rights. It has been a great pleasure and a great privilege, a great honor to be in conversation with both of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>